I voted for you! Wait a minute. That guy on the grassy knoll's got a gun. He's gonna shoot the president. Holy smokes, I've gotta do something. All right, Lee, time to become an American hero. ago, Vice President and Mrs. Johnson were spat upon and cursed by a seething crowd in the lobby of one of our hotels. Dallas is the city where many leaders and officials expressed anxiety and fear of incident when first learning of the President and Mrs. Kennedy's intention to be our guests. Dallas is the city where on the day of the President and First Lady's arrival, the Dallas Morning News ran a full-page ad with the mocking caption, Welcome, Mr. President. The ad contained a number of questions which were themselves accusations of President Kennedy, implying his cooperation with the U.S. Communist Party, his bloodily extermination of anti-communist allies, and his scrapping of the Monroe Doctrine in favor of the spirit of Moscow. In the name of God, what kind of city have we become? It's not the individual person of Dallas. It's something evil, festering, stinking. You who've written stories about the shame of Dallas and the rape of Americanism here know what I'm talking about. There's something that smells. And I want to get back to my own city because I, I'm going to vomit. Ten. Nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode one oh one. 101 of the Lone Gummin Podcast. This is your boy Rob Clark with you at the helm of the ship tonight. And I got a great show lined up for you. The reason I wanted to talk about this dude is he, he hasn't been on my radar uh, until recently. And it's kind of important, you know, in the big scheme of things that we talk about this guy because he's got some very interesting things to tell us and some very interesting connections of his own. <clears throat> and the man we're going to be talking about tonight is William McEwen Duff. That's right. The Duff, not the designated ugly fat friend, but William McEwen Duff. Former. British SAS secret or special forces badass. Okay, who came over here after he his military service in England and he came over here and joined our military. And the reason he's important is because he had a special kind of relationship with General Edwin Walker. Okay? Um, he had heard about what Walker was doing in the South, you know, and fighting against, you know, the civil rights movement and, uh, all his right wing policies and his anti-communist stance. And he was very, very down for that. Okay. And what he did, he was so impressed by general Walker that one day he got the urge to walk up to general Walker's house. 
and knock on the door. And of course, General Walker answers the door and they speak for a minute. And he tells him, look, you know, I'm really impressed with what you're doing. Um, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of hanging out to dry here. I really don't have a place to stay. Um, I'd be more than honored to work for you, sir, and do anything you need me to do. General Walker thinks about it for a minute and says, okay, I'll tell you what. How about you work for me? Uh, you do whatever I tell you to do. I'm not going to pay you, uh, but you can have room and board here in my house. You know, a very Larry Crayford, Jack Ruby-esque type of deal. Now, the, <clears throat> the result of this little deal resulted in the employment of Duff by Walker for approximately a period of five months spanning from, uh, you know, right around October, November 62 through March of 63. And the, the reason why this is important, now there was supposedly a falling out because General Walker wasn't home very much, uh, you know, from like the end of January uh, all through February and stuff. He was on his midnight ride crusade with the Reverend Billy James Hargis. They were touring the country, lecturing, uh, collecting funds to, uh, you know, to support their, their anti-communist agenda and their right wing movements. And General Walker wasn't home very much. And, the folks that stayed behind in Dallas to watch his house, people like William Duff. And apparently he had, you know, a couple other maids or house servants or whatever you want to call them living there too. Now the genesis of this is that some, for some reason, uh, Duff didn't like being ordered around by the women of the house and, and being told what to do, you know, to, you know, make coffee, uh, sweep this, take the trash out, you know, basic things. He didn't, he didn't feel like he should have to listen to them and this and that. And, uh, anyway, an argument ensued with general Walker and he was in quotes, let go around March, uh, beginning of March sometime. And the reason this is significant is because after the Walker shooting, okay. Dallas police tracked down William Duff, who was still in town, and they arrested him. And they charged him with the attempted shooting at General Walker. Um, I think they held him as long as they could. They couldn't find any evidence. Um, I'm sure, you know, when the police questioned Walker, you know, he was asked, you know, do you have, do you know of anybody that would want to do this to you? Uh, have you recently let any employees go that may have been a little disgruntled? Um, do you have any enemies this and that? And I'm sure this guy's name came up and he fit the bill, you know, former military guy. Um, same basic description as Oswald as, as we'll see here in a minute. Um, and we have his, uh, mugshot and you can see that over at tlgpodcast.com. And real quick, I, I want to thank Will over at, at, uh, JFK primary sources. That's primary sources dot wix dot com backslash home um, for helping me with some documents, obtaining some documents for this episode about Duff um, and basically bringing him to my attention. Now, I, I have been reading General Walker and the Murder of President Kennedy by Jeffrey Caulfield, and I just kind of happened upon this part in the book as well. So it seemed appropriate that I do a show about this because, like I said, I want to exchange information with you guys. And, 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 uh, you know, I really wasn't too familiar with this guy. So I do, I dove, I, 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 do, I dove in and I, I tried to find everything I could find about this guy. <clears throat> so let's basically start kind of at the beginning. Okay. Because, you know, this guy he is very complex and odd and, uh, We'll, we'll, you know, we'll get into it. Um, let me pull up my files here and, uh, let's see what we got going on here on Mr. William Duff. Now, I'm sorry. I lost my place here. 
Where you at, buddy? There you are. Okay. Now, I should tell you that Duff was a Scottish, of Scottish descent, okay? Um, and this is from an FBI memorandum. It's also commissioned exhibit number 2389. Uh, William McEwen Duff, also known as William McEwen McDuff, or Sandy, or Scotty, spelled with an I-E, or Scotty with a Y. Um, and this information concerning alleged association between General Edwin Walker and Jack Ruby. Now, this is important, folks, because <clears throat> I have been searching and searching high and low for some kind of a concrete connection between Jack Ruby and the extreme right wing and General Walker in particular, because... It's very important because when um, when Jack Ruby was in custody and he was being interviewed for the Warren Commission by Earl Warren, he specifically told Earl Warren, and let me get the exact quote for you. Okay, he told this. Mr. Ruby said, There is an organization here, Chief Justice Warren, if it takes my life at this moment to say it, and Bill Decker said, be a man and say it. Okay, so there is a John Birch Society right now in activity. And General Edwin Walker is one of the top men of the organization. Take it for what it's worth, Chief Justice Warren. Unfortunately for me, for me, giving the people the opportunity to get in power because of the act that I committed has put a lot of people in jeopardy with their lives. Don't register with you, does it? Chief Justice Warren says, no, I don't understand that. Now, this wasn't the only time Ruby mentioned the John Birch Society. Uh, he made further references to the John Birch Society as well as other significant revelations in his testimony that eluded the Warren Commission, HSCA, scholars and writers. Um, the Warren Commission conclusion on the Walker shooting incident were reported under the provocative heading, Prior Attempt to Kill the attempt on the life of Major General Edwin A. Walker. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, there you have it. I've been, now Jack Ruby's words have been haunting me all these years because he had to kill Oswald for a reason. Okay. And it wasn't just so Jackie Kennedy wouldn't have to come back and testify at Oswald's trial. There had to be some reason that Ruby would have done this. And when it comes to Duff, he gives us that connection. Now, let's go back to the Duff files. Um, so I can read to you exactly <clears throat> what was going on here with Duff and uh, this whole Jack Ruby deal. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay. Duff stated on January 24th, 1964, that he had seen many photographs of Ruby in the newspapers and that he was positive that he had never seen Ruby at any place and had no information about him whatsoever. He said that he'd never been in Ruby's nightclub in Dallas. But on May 25th, just four short months later, Duff laid claim to an association, actually, between Jack Ruby and General Walker, alleging that he had seen Ruby at the Walker residence as many as five or six times in the months that he was employed there. Okay, and he told this to... Uh, James Cantrell, a special agent with the Secret Service, uh, stationed in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Okay. He said, uh, <clears throat> Duff had claimed evidence of an association between Jack Ruby and General Walker that during the period of December 62 through March, while Duff was employed by General Walker and resided in his home, Ruby visited on the basis of about once a month each time in the company of two unidentified white males driving in a white Ford car 
not further described. Duff claimed identification of Ruby through photographs, having heard him addressed only as Jack. The others who accompanied Ruby were described as follows. Number one was a white male, mid-thirties, 5'11 to 6 foot, weighing 145, dark receding hair, and said to be a member of the John Birch Society. Number two was a white male, late 40s, heavy build, dark complected. Okay. Now Duff advised that the three had always convened uh, with each other in the living room of the Walker residence. Duff at no time overheard their conversation, he says. Duff, uh, when questioned concerning other witnesses, Duff said it was possible others in the Walker household whom he could not name might have identified Ruby, but he considered it doubtful that they would assist out of loyalty to General Walker. He mentioned one uh, Bob Sutton as a possible witness. Sutton, employed by a paper or printing firm in Dallas, was said to have visited at the Walker residence. Now, he may be referring to Robert Suri here and getting the name wrong. I don't know. Um, Duff had no explanation as to why he had not reported this in previous interviews, both by agents of the FBI and the Secret Service, other than to state a fear of General Walker, much like the fear that Jack Ruby portrayed to Earl Warren. He was being questioned. He was scared for his life. He begged Earl Warren to get him out of Dallas. He said, you take me to Washington and I'll tell you whatever you want to know. But his life is in danger as long as he's in Dallas. But he did tell Earl Warren about the John Birch Society and General Evan Walker. He didn't say he was scared of the government. He didn't say he was scared of, uh, you know, these powerful Texans. He said, uh, you know, he's scared of General Walker and the John Birch Society. So, you know, the man said it. And it's in print. Um, so and he also said this. Uh, he, uh, he was fearful of General Walker. He said he felt he knew too much of Walker's operation and of the persons visiting his residence, intimating that Walker was diverting funds collected for the John Birch Society to a personal account at the Highland Park Bank in Dallas, Texas, which is not out of the realm of possibility. They... Him and Billy James Hargis collected a lot, a lot, a lot of money on their midnight or their uh, midnight ride. Their, uh, their the little Christian crusade deal. Um, and of course he was collecting private donations, probably substantially large ones from, you know, well to do businessmen. And it's not out of the realm of possibility. He would have shoved a little in his personal account. You know what I mean? Um, then uh then we have this. Okay. Duff said that he knew nothing of this Lee Harvey Oswald fellow. Cantrell said that his receipt of this information from Duff pred- predicated on an earlier interview from April eighth, sixty four, and several subsequent telephone calls from Duff and his wife indicate Duff may be using this means to impress his wife and to restore their marital relationship. Duff's wife had threatened divorce on grounds he had misrepresented his background, even claiming to have the rank of captain in the U.S. Army. Duff called Cantrell and tried to get him to call his wife and tell him that he wasn't lying, that he didn't have any of these warrants out on him. Um, Cantrell said on the following day he had been unsuccessful in reaching Mrs. Duff. On May 25th, he received a long-distance telephone call from her in which she stated her husband had vital information in the case concerning the assassination of President Kennedy. A meeting was arranged on that evening at the police station in Chickasha, Oklahoma. It was at this time that Duff, in the presence of his wife, related the information concerning the alleged association of Jack Ruby and General Walker. Um, Agent Cantrell said that he had taken Duff aside in an effort to establish the truth, pointing out that if the information were not found to be true that Duff could be subject to prosecution. He invited Duff to change his story if it wasn't the truth while maintaining the fiction to his wife. So basically what he's saying here is Cantrell took him aside and said, look, I understand you want to impress your wife with, you know, this whole connection to the Kennedy assassination or whatever. Um, but look, if you're lying, 
you know, we're going to fry your ass. So you can tell me if you're lying and we'll just, you know, keep her thinking that you're telling us the truth. And <clears throat> that didn't fly over too well with the, with old Duff because Duff insisted on its truth and volunteered that he would even submit to a polygraph examination if desired. Duff requested that the polygraph examination wait, though, until his discharge from the Army on June 1, 64, on the grounds of fraudulent enlistment. He claimed to have been in the Air Force from December 57 to December 60 and had not so indicated when enlisting in the Army. So basically, he was getting a uh, shit can from the Army because he hadn't reported to them that he was with the Air Force before that. So he's in the process of getting kicked out of the army. He's in the process of a divorce. He's in the process of his life being in shambles. And this is all right around the time that he's leaving, you know, that, that all this general Walker stuff is coming to light after the assassination. And it's all finally coming to a head, you know, in mid 64, um, Agent Cantrell advised that he'd been informed by Cliff Roberts, Oklahoma Crime Bureau, that Duff had been examined by a psychiatrist at Fort Sill and had been diagnosed as a pathological liar. Now, Cliff Roberts, okay, this is a guy, a private detective that General Walker hired, okay, to follow Duff and discredit him because apparently Duff knew a hell of a lot about what was going on in the Walker household. Um, so here we have Cliff Roberts trying, trying to make it out to, uh, Agent Cantrell that, that, you know, you can't believe anything this guy says because he's been diagnosed as a pathological liar. Now on June 12, 64, Peggy Duff, okay. Duff's wife. Uh, she was a civilian employee of the U S army in the consolidated supply department at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, advised of the following in a telephone conversation initiated for the purpose of locating William Duff for an interview. Mrs. Duff said that she is now divorced from William Duff, a divorce filed by her attorney on February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, you mother effer, 1964 in Comanche County, Oklahoma, and that the divorce was final on June 3rd, 1964. Duff, she said, had been discharged from the U.S. Army at Fort Sill on June 2nd, the day before his divorce was final, and that he had left the Lawton area. Although Mrs. Duff said she had not seen Duff since June 3rd, he called her on the telephone on June 12th. At this time, Duff, who would not give his address, perhaps because he was supposed to pay her $100 a month in alimony, advised Mrs. Duff that he had secured employment in Oklahoma City through a General Clyde Watts, whom he described as an attorney at Oklahoma City and counsel for General Edwin Walker in Dallas, Texas. Duff claimed that he was living at, at the time with an elderly friend of General Watts, a friend who was retired. In order that Mrs. Duff might return a telephone call, which he had requested, Duff supplied the uh, the phone number for the residence of the individual, uh, so <laughs> the telephone was answered by an individual who sounded as though he were elderly and who summoned Duff to the phone by addressing him as Bill. Mrs. Duff said that this was a collect phone call to the number charges, which Duff accepted and that the call lasted for well over an hour. Um, in her conversation with Duff, Mrs. Duff said that she had reminded Duff that he was to contact agent Cantrell of the secret service for purposes of taking that polygraph that he had promised to, uh, following his discharge from the military. According to Mrs. Duff, Duff responded to this by saying, look, you notify Cantrell and I'll be gone. Mrs. Duff stated that she would judge by this statement that Duff had no intentions of pursuing this matter in which he had alleged that Jack Ruby had visited the residence of General Walker on occasion during Duff's deployment in the Walker residence. Okay, so first they tried to threaten this dude. They had him followed, um, you know, they were trying to discredit him. So then they tried a different approach. General Walker had his lawyer, 
General Watts, get in contact with Mr. Duff and secure him employment and secure him a place to live. Okay. Well, isn't that nice? Hey, look, we're being so nice. You look, look, you need to, you need to recant that whole Jack Ruby nonsense, man, because that could be very, very damning, um, you know, to us. Um, and he does, he changes his tune as we will see here. So let's see, where are we? I'm sorry. I got a damn, you know, it's the middle of winter and there is a stink bug in my house. I don't know where these damn things come from. And he just landed on my neck. So sorry if I freaked out there for a second, but I'm okay. <laughs> it just made me lose my place. Um, with regard to his current status, Mr. Duff said he'd been discharged, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. It's, it's quite evident that, you know, that he's been discharged and divorced. Duff said a week before moving to Oklahoma city, he had visited general Clyde Watts, uh, who is counsel for Edwin Walker by whom Duff had been employed in Dallas, Texas. He said he had met general Watts when the general had visited general Walker in Dallas. So he had known this fella. It had been through General Watts that he had been obtained temporary living quarters with a Marion Osborne in in Oklahoma City. Osborne being a friend of General Watts with the same recommendation he had obtained temporary employment at a firm managed by Mr. Osborne at the Paul T. Blakeney Company, a firm which distributes and repairs lawnmowers of commercial and home type. Mr. Duff said he anticipates General Watts will find employment for him as a heavy equipment operator in road construction by reason of his former association with General Walker. Okay, so now they'd found a place, got a place to live, they'd find him a job, and that they had promised him a better job doing what he wanted to do. Mr. Duff said that the information he had previously related and would now relate was based on that gained in connection with his employment by uh, General Edwin Walker from November 62 to April 63. He said he, empl- he had been employed by General Walker as his Batman. Uh, yeah, whatever that means. His Batman, his bitch boy, his more like his Robin to General Walker's Batman. I don't know. He defined Batman as a British military term for an orderly, a valet, or a personal aide, stating he previously had such experience in England. Mr. Duff said he had applied for the job on impulse as one day he had passed the residence and I've already told you this story. So we'll skip that part where he went up to Walker's door and all this and that. Um, Duff said that during this period and in performance of his duties, he observed that Walker had numerous visitors. When photographs of Jack Ruby appeared in the newspaper after his shooting of Lee Oswald, Mr. Duff said he believed him to be one of two individuals who had visited the Walker residence once each month in December, January, February, and March. Mr. Duff said that he is not sure of his identification, uh, but there is a doubt in his mind and that he would not swear definitely as to his identification of this individual as Jack Ruby. He said, there are a lot of men who look like Ruby adding why I saw one of Ruby's likeness in Oklahoma city the other day. Okay. So now he's backpedaling. Now he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, turning the wheels backwards on the bike. Okay. Cause now he's spinning backwards. He's, he's recanting and you're going to love this, this reason. Mr. Duff said that uh, what identification he had made on the basis of personal appearance only, a likeness which he had noted upon seeing the photographs of Ruby in newspapers, that that never had he heard General Walker or anyone else's Walker's household mention the name Ruby in any respect, nor had he nor had he any other basis which would indicate an association between Jack Ruby and General Walker. Mr. Duff stated that to his knowledge, the two individuals in question. Uh, you know, they visited these times. Okay. Uh, they always visited behind closed French doors. Mr. Duff stated that he had never overheard any of these conversations. He said Walker always conducted his business in this manner, not wishing to be disturbed. On the occasion of the third visit of these individuals, Duff said he had seen them arrive parking a white Ford at the corner. Mr. Duff was not able to pervert to provide a further description of the Ford vehicle. Mr. Duff said his view of the man whom he thought to be Jack Ruby was only a profile and only a view of the man's back. 
Okay. Mr. Duff described a man who he had previously thought as Jack Ruby. Okay. Now check out this description. He goes from seeing a picture of Jack Ruby in the paper from seeing Jack Ruby in person and, you know, making a mental match there to this. The person that he thought was Ruby is actually a white American male, 40 to 50 years of age, 5'8", 125 pounds, grayish white hair, and wearing a business suit. Duff described this individual as being very thin in appearance. Well, no doubt, if the dude's only weighing 125 pounds, I don't think Jack Ruby weighed 125 pounds since he was like 15 years old. Um, 125 pounds is deathly, sickly thin. And grayish white hair. Jack Ruby never had gray hair. Okay. So you see here, Mr. Duff is trying to distance his description of Jack Ruby. The second individual Duff described as a white male American in his late 40s, 5'11 to 6'2, 210, with an evident paunch. That's a gut for you people who don't know what a paunch is. This man had very black hair and was believed to be of, of Latin or Mexican descent, according to Duff. He was described as wearing a dark business suit. Neither man carried briefcases or dispatch cases of any type. Lawrence Howard. <coughs> Sorry. Had a bug in my throat there. Mr. Duff stated that he previously had not informed of this possible association between Jack Ruby and General Walker based on his personal identification because on the occasion of his interview, he had been interviewed at the hospital at Fort Sill and was more concerned with his personal welfare and his physical condition than on the matter in which he reported. Mr. Duff reiterated that while he cannot now be certain that the individual who visited Walker actually was Jack Ruby. In his view, this possibility alone was sufficient to require his reporting it to the FBI. He volunteered to take a polygraph test concerning the matters which he had reported. Okay, so now he's denied officially. Now, these are all Duff's things. He At first, he denied any association or any knowledge of anything. This would have been early in January 1964. Four months later, he's singing like a birdie, okay? Now, he's recanting all of that. Duff stated that he had never, nor had he been in the association of Lee Harvey Oswald, that he has never seen any one of Oswald's description at the residence of General Walker. Yet he gave one <laughs> of the person supposedly with Jack Ruby. Now, wouldn't it be interesting if we had Jack Ruby, Lee Oswald, and Lawrence Howard meeting General Walker at his house in early of 63. That'd be pretty amazing, wouldn't it? Hmm. Um, Mr. Duff was asked whether or not he was acquainted with one Andre Angeles. He said no. Uh, Duff stated that he'd never... Uh, Duff stated that he had left the employment of Walker because of friction between himself and several women of the office staff. He said he had finally had enough of this and left. He had General Walker packed his bag for him and sit on the porch and told him to get get to stepping, homie. Um, so, you know, we have all this stuff, okay? And I'm trying to get to – okay, here it is. Now, in the spring of 63, shortly after someone shot at General Walker in his home in Dallas, Texas, Clyde Watts hired two PIs in, in Oklahoma City to go to Dallas and attempt to ascertain the identity of the person who had shot at Walker. These investigators were Bill Keister and Cliff Roberts. During the investigation conducted by Keister and Roberts, information was received that one Bill Duff, a Scotsman, who was at the one time employed by Walker or Walker's staff, had allegedly remarked he was the person who had shot at Walker. Keister and Roberts made contact with Bill Duff without disclosing their true identity or capacity as private detectives. They offered Duff $5,000 to shoot General Walker. Duff was interested in the proposition and discussed with Keister and Roberts a plan to shoot General Walker. A tape recording was made of this discussion, and this recording, along with the results of the investigation by Keister and Roberts, were turned over to the Dallas Police Department. 
At no time did Duff ever admit to Keister and Roberts that he was the person who had previously attempted to shoot General Walker. Now, at the time, Keister and Roberts were in contact with Bill Duff. Uh, he, aside, he, he resided at, you know, on Lewis Street in Dallas, Texas. So basically what they're saying here is they had heard rumors that Duff was saying that he was the one that had shot at General Walker. Now they're offering him money to actually shoot General Walker, and he's interested, and they discuss plans for it. Okay? Uh, so this guy Duff's not really squeaky clean. And this was, you know, right after the attempted assassination. Um, this is before the JFK assassination even even happened. Um, so, in connection with this matter, he had conducted an investigation concerning William Duff, offering Duff $5,000 to shoot Walker in an effort to establish whether he had information concerning the earlier attempt. During the discussions with Duff relative to this plan, Duff never made any admissions, okay, in an apparent attempt, uh, although he attempted to show some knowledge in an apparent attempt to impress Roberts and Keister, Roberts said he considered Duff to be a complete phony in every respect and was convinced he had gone along with Roberts and Keister merely in an attempt to get some money out of them. Um, and they give a little background information here, and I'll give it to you. Uh, Duff was born in, in 1931 at Stirlingshire, Scotland, and on January 24, 64, was serving in the U.S. Army at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, he enlisted under serial number, blah, 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 and was connected with Battery D, 1st Training Battalion, USATC, FA, Fort Sill. Duff, uh, when interviewed, claimed he had been a member of the British Army, the Argyles, an infantry unit from 49 to 52. That would be the British SAS. He worked for a number of years for the British National Railroad as an engine driver and came to Dallas, Texas in November of 62. He said that at the time the newspapers were full of news of General Walker and that he felt he might get a job with the general as his Batman. Duff, according to his own statement, went to General Walker's home, was hired, and resided at the Walker house as an employee. Uh, he left the employ of General Walker because of friction with a woman on general staff. I doubt there was any women on General Walker's staff. Yes, that's a penis joke. But, you know, because General Walker was gay. Okay. That was a cheap one. But good. In August of 63, he left Dallas and went to Oklahoma City, where he enlisted in the United States Army and was sent to Fort Polk, Louisiana. And on December 10, 63, he left Fort Polk, went to Fort Boone, back to Fort Sill, um, he claimed in July of 63 that he was investigated by the DPD in connection with the attempted shooting of General Walker. He said he took a lie detector test and was completely cleared as a result. He is reportedly a former chauffeur and, gen and handyman for General Walker. Now I'm going to read you some things about Duff and you tell me if they sound a little familiar to you. He's white. He was a male. Okay. He was five feet, nine inches tall. He weighed 150 pounds. He had blue eyes. He had brown receding hair. His father was deceased. He had a brother named Robert. Sound familiar yet? <laughs> uh, so many coincidences. It's, it's craziness. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this whole thing is crazy. But that's not all about Duff, okay? Because we also have this little kernel of a nugget of something. And it's very interesting because you can take it a million different directions. Okay, now in December of 63, shortly after the assassination, there was a lot of people reporting to the FBI and the Dallas police that they had seen Oswald in the company of Fill in the blank. Okay. Now, there was a restaurant owner in Dallas by the name of Joe Loria. And he made one such claim in December of 63 that he saw Lee Harvey Oswald in his restaurant. And that, you know, at the time it didn't really mean anything to him. But, of course, after the assassination, he recognized the man as being in the company of another gentleman that he knew only as Scotty, who was a regular at his restaurant, which is why he knew his name. 
Now, can we prove that Scotty was Duff? A well, lawyer said Scotty was Scottish. So, that pretty much narrows it down because I don't know how many people were Scott, Scottish people were in Dallas in the early 60s. Probably not too many. Now, of course, this slipped through the cracks of you know the FBI and the Dallas police because really it was probably another crackpot accusation to them. But had they actually known who Scotty was, then this little tip might have been followed up on and proven to be a little bit more interesting. Because if you have now, now Loria said that this 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 thing take took place about eight months before the assassination, which would put it back in March of sixty three. So if you have Oswald and you have Duff eating together in a restaurant, probably talking about something. Okay, maybe maybe Duff was a disgruntled employee. Maybe, okay, Oswald, in the course of his staking out General Walker's house, you know, and taking pictures, he may have run into this guy and started questioning questioning him. And maybe they shared a common bond of of uh of hatred for General Walker and collaborated on the whole assassination attempt. Or um you know, at this time, maybe Duff was still going along with what General Walker was trying to do and enlisted the help of this fella that he saw sniffing around General Walker's house to stage a false assassination attempt in order for General Walker to garner more media attention for his causes and his beliefs. You know, because if if somebody's if they're trying to kill him, then he must really be important. People must really be scared of what he's trying to do. And the whole underlying theme of the whole midnight ride with Billy James Hargis, you know, was they were trying to gather up support for an army. They wanted to actually revolt and take back our government from the Commie loving SOBs in Washington. And you better believe they believed it. Okay. They didn't call Dallas the city of hate for no reason. No, no, no. They got that title honest, boy. Dallas was full of hatred. I mean, they were spit, they even spit on LBJ. Okay. When he came and, you know, they tried to get it out of Lyle Stevenson. They were crazy. You know, down there, that's what it was a perfect breeding ground for the John Birch Society and all these right wing hate groups, the KKK, you know, and all these anti communist folks um, that we can prove real connections to General Walker, to, you know, real connections between Miltier and Bannister and Walker, you know, and, and several other folks, Leander Perez. Um, you know, the possibilities are endless. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that Walker staged this shooting because a couple months prior, he had toyed with the idea of having himself kidnapped, okay, in order to draw attention to himself. So, you know, it wasn't his first foray into fakery. Um, so, you know, there, there's a thousand possibilities here. But the real crux of it is, is why, if true, was Oswald meeting with Duff at, you know, before the attempted shooting of General Walker? You know, why, why did Duff state that he didn't know nothing about nothing? And then four months later, he's hell bent on, yep, Jack Ruby can't used to come to his house with members of the John Birch Society. You know, and blah, 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 blah. And then he recanted again, you know, after his life's in shambles, he's getting booted out of the army. He's getting divorced and it's all happening right about the same time. He's losing his place to live, you know, so he's, 
he's becoming reliant on General Walker again to get his life back together. And probably some kind of a deal was made through, you know, either Clyde Watts, who was General Walker's attorney, you know, or, or uh, this guy Roberts, um, General Walker's private detective. So that's why Duff recanted his story. But, you know, we still have the whole Joe, Joe Loria accusation. You know, I also find it interesting about uh, a fellow by the name of John Martin. Now, you might be saying to yourself, who the hell is John Mort- Martin? Well, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, uh, a little side note with Duff. He apparently knew a whole lot more than about what was going on in the Walker household. Um, Duff's report to the FBI that queer people visited Walker's residence suggested Duff knew about Walker's closeted homosexuality. And I'm sure, you know, if, if Duff was there in his house, he, you know, Walker probably came on to him. Um, so there's that. Now, Walker's homosexuality was not publicly known until he was arrested in 1976 by the Dallas Park Department for public lewdness. He reportedly had made sexual advances to a plainclothes policeman. Walker responded to the charges in his unique way, saying it's more of the same, but with some further clarification of uh, poses and setups of mutual interest, which can be worked both ways. That's all I've got to say. And then they arrested him again in 1977 in a public men's room on a second charge of public, le- public lewdness. So, there you have that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find this section on John Martin. And I'm probably missing it. But anyway, I'll uh, knock it down a little for you. But uh, John Martin was a guy who used to serve under General Walker in Germany. And the reason he's interesting is he had a videotape, a home movie of Lee Oswald in New Orleans handing out his Fair Play for Cuba committee leaflets. He also his, uh, his home movie also included the uh, Carlos Bringier fight and the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald. But interesting, before that footage of Lee Oswald in August of 1963 in New Orleans, before that footage is footage of General Walker's house right after the attempted assassination that clearly shows his house in Dallas, the broken pane of window glass. Um, you know, of course he has an, it's, you know, of course he has an innocuous story. Like, you know, you know, he had served under him. He had heard about the, uh, the attempted shooting of him and he went by his house and got it. And then he traveled to New Orleans for something and just happened to be recording when, you know, he saw this odd fellow Lee Oswald creating all this public chaos. Um, now if you go look at the, the John Martin film today, and the only place I've seen it is is at the uh, Sixth Floor Museum website, and it's it's very interesting to say the least. I'll put up a link to it on TLGPodcast.com for you to go check out and look. And there's been alleged that there is an earlier version of this movie that that has the entire fight with Brignier and his arrest, but. You don't see that in this version. All you see is uh, him handing out leaflets and then him being led away by police and then a bunch of these Fair Play for Cuba committee leaflets laying on the ground. And then it's over. So very interesting how that could possibly be uh, mistook. Now, I want to read you something. And I first heard it on my friend Doug in the Dallas Action Podcast. When he had uh, Jeffrey Caulfield on his show. Now, for those of you who may have missed it, I would urge all of you to go back and listen to all those interviews over on the Dallas Action. Um, Now, he wrote Billy James Hargis a letter 
General Walker did in 1966. And I'm going to read it to you because it's very, very interesting. It says, Another peculiarity with DeMore and Shield returning to Dallas from Haiti, just as Rubenstein is allegedly dying with cancer and might talk in parentheses, DeMore and Shield made a front page spread and our informant produced his address and whom he is staying with. And it's not good. A warning underlined when Rubenstein leaves the hospital in a box in parentheses, the only way he will come out into parentheses. There is no further block to returning the blame again to the right wing. The books and press will gradually pick it up again. RFK must have it. It must be done as insurance and assurance and RFK political necessity underlined. So you see, I think this right here is telling us that, you know, Jack Ruby is not going to make it out of the hospital alive. And that's exactly the way it happened. And that RFK is next on the list. Okay. He's saying it must be done as insurance and assurance that they will not be investigated again. So there you have Walker trying to protect the right wing. So to me, we finally have the connection between Jack Ruby and General Walker and the John Birch Society that he was so scared of to stay in Dallas and be around. And the way I figure it is that, you know, I think Jack Ruby was into a lot of things. Running guns is one of them. Now, General Walker had a lot of these Cuban raiders visiting his house. Uh, they were getting supplies and guns from the John Birch Society and these uh, different supporters of the cause. And possibly Ruby was procuring guns for them. Um, but Ruby was likely lo- used for his connections in the Dallas Police Department. And in, in order to attain the services of, of a couple of dirty cops or cops that would do things for money. And I'm going to lay all, I'm going to lay it all out for you in a future episode to come. Um, but not here today. Uh, and, it, and it involves Larry Craver. It involves Jack Ruby and why he had to shoot Oswald. Um, and we're going to tie everything together in a nice, neat little bow. I just wanted this today to set the stage for where we're going to go with all this because in light of this information, because you know, I used to, I used to think that, okay, what's the connection between New Orleans and Dallas? And now that we've established a plausible connection between all these right wingers and and what they were doing and what Oswald was doing in New Orleans and who was running him and uh, you know who was who he was associating with and who these people really were, that the picture is becoming clearer and clearer. And I can't for the life of me figure out why the investigation never went this way, but it is what it is. Um, you know, these were very powerful, scary folks back then. And, uh, you know, these, these right wingers, these racists, these anti integrationists were all over the place in various, you know, governments, uh, various structures, corporate structures. I mean, they, uh, they were into everything. They were everywhere. They were in the police departments. They were in, in government. They were in everywhere. So, you know, I'm just saying, um, very interesting stuff about William Duff and his associations with Walker and Ruby and Oswald, all in a nice, neat little bow here. Can we believe him? I don't know. You know, he, uh, he uh, maybe lied first out of fear and loyalty to General Walker. And then uh, something happened. He was like, you know what? Screw this guy. You know, I'm just going to tell the truth. And then they started making his life a living hell and said, all right, look, man, we'll help you. We'll get you a job. We'll set you up. We'll find you a place to live. We'll give you money. 
you just got to go back on that story about Ruby and Walker because it does not look good. And that's exactly what he did. And then you just heard it here. General Walker telling Billy James Hargis, look, Jack Ruby's not leaving that hospital unless it's in a box. You can take that to the bank. So once again, I encourage everybody to go listen to the Dr. Jeffrey Caulfield interviews over on the Dallas Action with Doug. He did a great job with him. And uh, I might put up links. But, I mean, you can find Doug's stuff. It's on Spreaker, Stitcher. Um, just go back and listen. Um, cause I think he's on a little hiatus right now, but he'll be back. Um, so in the meantime, check that out and stay tuned for more good stuff coming from your boy and the Lone Gummit Podcast. Once again, let me thank everybody for supporting the show. And if you haven't yet, head to iTunes, leave me a review, uh, rate the show, uh, give me a thumbs up, give me a like. You know, it, it just helps the exposure of the show, and I appreciate everything. We're knocking on the, you know, the 40,000 download door right now, and that's amazing to me. So thanks, to everybody. Always check out my friends. Thank you, Sebastian, and uh, over at VP1, and my buddy Will at JFK Primary Sources for a lot of this uh, information here tonight. And my buddies Carmine Chuck, Neapolis Media Group. We're going to have something coming for you soon. Uh, hopefully towards the end of the week. Uh, pretty big, cool show because Carmine's book is coming out, Two Princes and a King. So if you haven't yet, head over to Amazon, pre-order it. So when it comes out, you get your copy first. Okay, guys? That's it for your boy. Somebody's in the can, beamed up the satellite down directly to your ears, people. This is your boy. Peace. Peace.